Hello, Book 2. I've got another random shelf tour for you here. This is a shelf that is one of four that used to be devoted exclusively to ancient Rome, which brings to mind that brief, now over, social media meme about how often men think about the Roman Empire. <laughs> I was kind of smiling while that was happening. It was kind of amusing, but uh, I'm glad to see it over. It only had one, it only had two points to it. That whole meme only had two points to it. One was to make the creator of that meme a million dollars, and that worked. And the other was the memesters, creators of memes like this, totally artificial memes like this, have a higher goal now that society has become so stupid. In addition to making a million dollars, which is what they all want, they want to retire on this one creation. In addition to that, they also want the mainstream legacy media in the United States to take it seriously, just briefly, however briefly it is, however briefly they manage to do that. Uh, and the creator of this particular meme succeeded on both those. They, they made a million dollars, and there was an op-ed about how often men think about the Roman Empire in, of course, the New York Times. So, so they succeeded. I want to underscore here what I hope doesn't need underscoring, which is that the whole thing was fake. The whole thing was fake. The, it's not like the girlfriends and the wives of the men allegedly being filmed at random being asked how often in a week they think about the Roman Empire. It's not like those wives actually did film those things just off the cuff. And then, what, emailed the drives to the compiler of the video who then put together, hey, I just noticed something. All of our boyfriends and, and husbands are thinking about the Roman Empire on a regular basis. Uh, no, <laughs> no, the whole thing was completely artificial, and it had two goals, to make its creator a million dollars and to get mainstream media attention, and it succeeded. But uh, this this particular shelf would fail in that meme test anyway, because once upon a time, this was a pure Roman history section. I probably have the equivalent of four or five, probably a whole bookcase of books on Roman, on Roman history, uh, but they're not together anymore. My my print and paper books are undergoing an enormous upheaval. <laughs> so so they aren't all together even here. Well, the first one that we have is something that is just recently found. A, a study uh, by the great classicist Paul McKendrick of the philosophical works of Cicero. Who, when he was not in power, retired to one of his country villas and wrote Cod Philosophy. And this, thankfully, is not a celebration of those works, of course, because it's precious little in any philosophy, let alone his, a dilettante's philosophy, to celebrate. Rather, this is a study of them, and it was exhilaratingly good. Oh, my. It reminded me of, uh, it's not on this shelf, I don't think. Uh, yes, this. It reminded me of this. Uh, Cicero as evidence. Not the evidence in Cicero, but what can we learn, especially from Cicero's court writings, the, uh, the writings that he did he wrote all of his summation speeches. He didn't give them in the way, in the form that they have, that we have them, but he wrote them all. It's fascinating to look at them as historical documents. This is the same sort of thing. Treating the writing of Cicero rather than translating it or celebrating it. Uh, okay, then we have Guglielmo. This is from the beginning of the, of the 20th century instead of the 21st. Uh, this author did a multiple volume, I don't actually off the top of my head remember how many volumes, this author did a multiple volume history of uh, the changeover from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, an incredibly well documented period in human history. And I don't have all of his volumes, I, uh, I have two of them. Uh, this one, volume three, which is the fall of the aristocracy, the fall of the Republic, and then uh, volume 2, which is his uh, his book on Julius Caesar, that actually doubles as one of the best Julius Caesar biographies that I know of. <laughs> Somebody's upset because she's not over here. <laughs> she could, of course, she could, of course, come over here. <laughs> but no, <laughs> no, she needs to be carried like a little princess. But these are, uh, Guglielmo is incredibly detailed uh, and has that old style scholarship that I love so much that usually is combined with a good deal of eloquence. Uh, okay, then we have J.F. Lazenby. This is Hannibal's War, the best book on the Second Punic War. Really, really detailed, really, really uh, exhaustive. 
I, I of course have a sweet spot when it comes to the, to the Second Punic War for the Roman historian Livy, but when, you, when it comes to a modern study, you just it doesn't get any better than Lazenby, I don't think. Uh, oh, okay, right, you're not Roman history. This is uh, something that we've just recently seen on this channel. This is the, uh, the Eye of the Story by Eudora Welty. There she is at her front door. Uh, this is a collection of her deadline prose, reviews, prefaces, speeches, that sort of thing. And I, I knew that I had a copy of this. I actually thought that I got rid of this, but, uh, but no. Uh, I just recently found a hardcover of this, so I don't, I don't need this trade paperback, even though the hardcover does not have her on the cover, which is a decided plus. Maybe I will commit the heresy of all heresies and cut the cover off this and use it as a bookmark in the hardcover. <laughs> so maybe I'll do that. You can't stop me. <laughs> uh, okay, then we have an Oxford paperback. This is The Roman Revolution by Ronald Sim, also about that exact same period, the change from the Republic to the Empire, the change from uh, a fully functioning, wealthy, extremely prosperous, and seemingly stable representative form of government, the tribes got to vote, you as a Roman citizen got the franchise, it was extremely watered down, there were, <clears throat> there were moneyed and powerful oligarchies and families involved, but it was a kind of representative government. And this chronicles the change from that to autocracy, which happened in the lifespan of one adult person. It doesn't take long. It doesn't take forever to do. It's not the decline and fall. It happens. It can happen in the lifespan of one adult person. Uh, all it takes is the election, uh, or even false election, of a demigod, uh, a demagogue who values his own personal aggrandizement over any kind of country or duty of any kind. All that's all it takes. In Rome's case, it took a succession of doing that. It, Rome had to do that three or four times with three or four different demagogues. But no system is, is strong enough to withstand that, so it eventually, it eventually fell. Uh, oh, then we have a thin thing. This is uh, D.R. Shackleton Bailey. This is his profile of Horace, the Roman poet Horace. Shackleton Bailey did a lot of translating of Horace. He's a, he's a fantastic translator, also a fantastic thinker. Here he gives you as much about Horace as, you, as we can know. All done with really kind of a scrupulous scholarship that I like. Uh, okay. Uh, you aren't Roman history. Oh, my. Uh, this is an old anthology. When did this come out? 70s? Uh, yeah, 1979. This is an old anthology called Book Reviewing. It just had text on the cover, so I gussied it up a little <laughs> with Superman fighting his greatest hits. Uh, and this is a collection of essays of various periodical editors and commissioning editors and managing editors and whatnot talking about book reviewing. Many of these separate pieces give the, the writers rules about book reviewing, what they think is important for you to remember and whatnot. A lot of them cover the very basics. There are specialized essays on reviewing children's books or reviewing longer pieces or getting a longer word count and how you manage that. I don't know why. I don't know why I, I got this, but I do find it interesting. More so for the identities, the separate identities of the writers than for any of the very basic advice that they're giving. Uh, are you going to be Rome? Oh, yeah. Okay. This is uh, Christopher McKay. This is the breakdown of the Roman Republic. Very good scholarly work on that very subject. That, that appears to be, of course, if you study Rome, this is more than likely the subject that you're going to have a lot of books on. And this is really, really good. Not, not gangbusters when it comes to readability, but really, really good. Uh, okay, then we have, uh, this is Matthias Gelser's biography of Julius Caesar, a really good Julius Caesar biography. Uh, not my favorite. I don't think my favorite is here. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think a couple of my favorites are here, but if you, if, again, if you're going to have a bookcase on ancient Rome and you're not studying the later Roman empire, you know, you and Marcus, the thing that you ruled together or the Eastern Roman empire, if you're not doing that, then you're going to gravitate to Caesar because that's where all the sources are. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, this is fairly new. Am I remembering that right? This is, this is, you're fairly new. Yeah, 2019. I wonder if we saw this on this channel. This is Kathleen McCarthy. This is I, the Poet. Her, her little collection for, who, who did this? Cornell University Press. Her little collection of studies of, um, all of the Roman, the famous Roman poets who wrote in the first person, even though they weren't intending that, usually they weren't intending that first person to be them. They still wrote in the third person anyway. 
or the first person anyway. So the, the uh, I remember this being quite good and not nearly as dry as I was expecting. I was expecting it to be awful. The university press in the 21st century. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, you're not Roman history. This is from uh, probably the 1940s. Yeah, 1940. Uh, this is uh, an incredibly famous writer. One of the most famous writers of her day. Uh, this is her autobiography. She had a runaway bestseller, but then a string of other bestsellers. She was known by name by every bookseller in the country. Everyone knew her last two books because the guarantee the customer was going to come in. They were going to want those last two books, but they weren't going to remember the names. They were going to remember a little bit about the subject matter. You had to take them to the right place. Uh, and she also created a character her first time at bat, she created a character that was routinely described as iconic, as unforgettably American, as a character who many a critic said in future generations, centuries from now, her name may be forgotten, but the name of this character will be remembered. And the name of that character is the judge from Blood Meridian. Oh no, <laughs> no, no! This this is just the object lesson. This the, the name of that character is Mrs. Wiggs, and you don't know that name, and you don't know the book that I'm talking about, and you've never seen it in a bookstore because it hasn't been in print in almost a hundred years. And the uh, the name of the author uh, is Alice Rice, and this is her biography, The Inky Way, her autobiography. This is a delightful book about the the turn of the 20th century and her marriage to her husband, who was a fairly, when she met him, a fairly handsome and ascetic poet, they managed to have a great deal of affection for each other. I don't know that it would be recognizable as what we would call love, but it was real. Iron strong. And they were a team. He was a well-respected poet, but she were, the, Mrs. Wiggs and the Cabbage Patch was the best-selling book of a decade. It, of, a, of a decade. It was an absolute phenomenon that is now completely... Well, let's see what, let's see what the, uh, the publisher on the Dust Jacket... I'm sure that they will... That they, they, uh, they, if this came out in 1940, I'm sure the publisher was thinking that in the year 2023, people would still be talking about them. Uh, you're not going to let me down, are you? You're not. Uh, this is from Appleton Century Company. In the early part of the century, a Kentucky girl wrote a modest little story that made book history. For two years after publication, it was one of the six bestsellers, only to be replaced by its sequel. Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch has been translated into seven languages, printed in Braille for the Blind. It has been dramatized and played in America, England, Australia, South Africa, and the Orient. It has had four screen versions and was broadcast for three consecutive years over the radio. Today, 40 years after its publication, it has delighted over a million readers, and the character of Mrs. Wiggs is said to be one of the seven that, that America has given to the literary picture gallery of the world. <laughs> as well known as that of, Mrs. Micawber, of Mr. Micawber, she is better loved. And you've never heard of her. No reader today has ever heard of her. Completely gone. 100% completely gone. So, sick transit Gloria Mundi for all the literary phenomenons today. <laughs> but this is actually a very delightful book. I, it, it's a, it was a different literary world, uh, recognizable in some ways, but, but uh, very different in others. One of the ways that it was recognizable is that a, a book and an author could get a huge burst in sales if a U.S. president noticed the book. If that were true, that ended with President Obama. But what in the for a hundred years before then, that could often change things for the author. And the the president here was Theodore Roosevelt, who read everything, and read it voraciously and also thoroughly, and sent her a note saying, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed your book. If you're ever in Washington, feel free to send me a line. And she and her husband thought. Okay, that would be a little awkward, but they did. The next time they were going by D.C., they did send a line and probably got an invitation to lunch with the president and his wife. Let's just let's just talk about. It. There was one other person there. The only other person at that lunch uh, was a figure that that Mark Richardson would know. He would know this this archaeologist, this ancient archaeologist's name. None of you would. And they got along like gangbusters. All of them did. Of course. A Roosevelt lunch, and there were also children running in and out, screaming their heads off. But uh, 
that that helped uh, Mrs. Wiggs a lot. It it didn't it was and in this case it wasn't necessary because oh my god it sold like crazy anyway. Uh, but the, the author is very charming. She is she is very humble and commonsensical the whole time. It never goes to her head. She's she's never talking about how you know this was destiny or whatnot. There are, there are many charming stories in here. I can't remember if she tells the story of another U.S. president that she met. I don't remember if that story is in here or not. Uh, she was invited to a big gala for all Harper's editors, for all Harper's literary figures, anybody connected with Harper's, anybody, anybody. It ended up being anybody who's anybody in the literary world. Uh, she she went to this gala and was greeted right away by William Dean Howells, uh, the author of The Rise of Silas Lapham, that is right on the edge of being Mrs. Wiggs and the Cabbage Patch, so right on the edge of being unknown. Um, and there were a whole bunch of literary lights there, a very stiff and formal occasion of a type that you, you got in the early years of the 20th century that went away with the First World War. Um, and a a uniformed popinjay, uh, a man in, with medals and pilots and a sword at his side and whatnot, whisked her away to lead her to where she was going to be seated. And she found him very officious and very, very bright and shiny, very, very intimidating. She found the whole thing intimidating. And she was wandering around, not knowing anyone, not really knowing what to do. When a kindly man, she, she, she wrote uh, to her husband that she looked in this man's face and knew right away that he was the friendliest person in the room. And he was smiling at her because he could see that she was a little bit off her pins and needles. And she wandered over to him and he welcomed her like she was an old friend and smiled. She made a mention of the fact that his smile started in his eyes and was radiant, was amazingly welcoming. And she, all of a sudden, all of her nervousness was gone. And he, he said in a very crisp Midwestern accent, he said, it was quite, quite the assembly, isn't it? <laughs> no wonder you're feeling a little nervous. And she, she told him, I'm not feeling nervous anymore. Thanks to you. She put her hand on his arm. They started chatting away, not necessarily about books, more about people watching kind of a gentle mockery of the, of the assembled crowd until that uniformed guy showed up to find her because she had slipped away. She was supposed to go to where she was supposed to sit and sit there. <laughs> You're supposed to behave. Why do you think I went to the bother of getting you into line like a little chick in a farmyard? <laughs> and the uniform man was a man named Archie Butt. And the very nice man that she was shooed away from was President William Howard Taft, <laughs> who had the same effect on her that he had on everybody. Oh, calm down. Oh, it'll be fine. Isn't this a little funny? <laughs> Uh, I don't remember that story's in here, but there are a lot of stories like that that are in here. And this is the story also of Mrs. Wiggs and the Cabbage Patch. Of course it is, since no one would care about this author. No one, no one would care about a local Kentucky author, if not for that bestseller book. Although even there, she's incredibly generous with other Kentucky authors who are even more forgotten than she is. Uh, but you're not Roman history. She's not Roman history. Uh, oh, right. Speaking of Theodore Roosevelt, and when am I not? Um, uh, this is... Uh, a two-volume work by Sam Dill. This is Seen Better Days. This is a little bit water-warped, or as we say in Southie, water-wopped. Uh, this is this is his Roman Society. He wrote a two-volume work called Roman Society. One from uh, uh, from Nero to Marcus, Marcus Aurelius, who we call Marcus. We just know him as Marcus. Uh, and one as uh, the last century of the Western Empire. I got I got the two of these. See, one of them is. One of those little, a little wavy, but it doesn't matter because I've been through these a million times. These are so good. They are social and especially literary studies of ancient Rome. And these also, I mean, Mrs. Wiggs was no doubt, was no, no, no sooner out the door for that private lunch by Theodore Roosevelt than probably Sam Dill was in the door. He, he went to the White House a couple of times. 1906, so right around the same time. And Roosevelt gobbled up these books and absolutely loved to talk about them. So that also helped the author. Um, okay, we have another old book. Uh, what is this? Oh, great. Oh, I remember finding this. Uh, this is a guy named J.C. Tarver. This is also from uh, the early part of the century, 1902. This is Tiberius the Tyrant. Uh, a, a biography of the Emperor Tiberius that is not at all. I mean, it's next to Dill here on the shelf. It's in the presence of Guglielmo on the shelf, but this is just the author taking down an English language translation of Suetonius' Life of Tiberius and having a blast with it. <laughs> so this, is, this is just uh, heavily watered 
propaganda. It's, it's, not, it's not. It's really fun. It's really fun. But the 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 so called real Tiberius barely makes an appearance at any point in the work. Uh, Oh, great. Oh, fantastic. Okay, this is Alan Ward's book. This is an ex-library copy. Uh, this is Marcus Crassus and the Late Roman Republic. Uh, another great and very serious work of Roman history about the incredibly greedy financier who very much wanted to be the guy who took the state into his own possession as a thing that would now be his pet. He saw all around him all the men who were doing that or who had tried to do that. There was Marius and there was Sulla. There was, that's Marcus Crassus, there was Pompey the Great uh, at the exact same time as Crassus. And waiting in the wings, there was also Gaius Julius Caesar. And Crassus saw all of that and very much wanted to be that guy. He very much wanted that. None of these people cared at all about the Rome to which they owed everything. Didn't care about it at all. No sense of obligation. Just, I, I know this is a possession this is a toy. I don't care about the people at all. I know this is a possession. This is a toy. And what I really want is for it to be my toy. Uh, and in Crassus's case, and in the case of a couple of other of those men, it was also a breakneck race between possessing that toy or letting that toy crush you with lawsuits. Uh, nothing more dangerous than a would-be autocrat who is facing several felony indictments and has a chance to take power. That's, uh, that's going to be the ultimate motivator. Uh, this is this is just tremendous tremendous scholarship. I must have got this rattle just recently. Uh, okay, this is a shorter thing. Oh right, okay. This is uh, Antonio Santo Suso. This is storming the heavens. Uh, a, a thin work on uh, well, basically on using soldiers to get your way in civilian in in the civilian world of Rome. What what, what would you do if you if you have ro soldiers at your beck and call? It's also about soldiers' life and about legitimate soldier activities. Quite good. Quite good. I don't remember if this is translated or not. Certainly read like it was translated. Uh, do you translate it at all? No? He's asserted the copyright in 1988. He's probably dead by now. Uh, although every time I say that, I'm wrong. No, you're not mentioning that, that this is translated. It just, re just reads like that. Okay. Uh, oh, all right. All right. This next one is not Roman history. This is the furthest thing from it. This is Whit Burnett. A heck of a guy, a wonderful, warm guy, who was forever and ever editor of Story Magazine, which I think is still in print. I think you can still get Story Magazine if you have a retail bookstore in your home. I live in a little backwater town, very, very non-literary, called Boston, where I don't have such a thing, and so I can't get a copy. Uh, but he was he was that the editor of Story Magazine forever and ever, and he put out a, he and his wife put out a really good professional publication that was nevertheless sloppy seconds and sloppy thirds for the other really good publications. If it was, if it was uh, well, The New Yorker was just starting, or uh, The Atlantic, or whatnot. It was Saturday Review. The Edinburgh Review, I think, was still truckling along there. And if you, if you sent something to them and they didn't want it, a story or a piece of some kind... Story Magazine was right there, and it was really it was really good. It was really well-respected. Plenty of people got their literary starts at Story Magazine, and uh, Will Burnett was perfectly happy to tout those successes. He knew that would only help his magazine, but he never changed the bottom line. No matter how well-regarded Story got, he still wanted everyone who submitted him to know, I know exactly why you're submitting to me. I know why you're submitting to Story Magazine. It's because all the big boys turned you down. Now, that's okay. I have a professional-looking journal. I will give you a light dusting of editorial help. I will publish your work, and you are by now in some pretty distinguished company. But I know why you're sending this to me, and your pay is going to reflect that. <laughs> you're not going to make any money from running your work in Story Magazine. What you'll get is exposure. A really good exposure. Well, there's nothing wrong with that uh, at all. And he wrote a memoir, uh, The Literary Life and the Hell with It. <laughs> this is all about, it's just a collection of literary set pieces. Little little uh, column type things. Reading in a hammock, reading on your day off, reading in a snowstorm. Uh, there are some protracted studies of authors in here, but... Uh, but mainly this is just lighthearted literary thoughts, and it's delightful. Absolutely delightful. It's, it's, you can see that is, that is a famous New Yorker artist who did a few, I think there are a few spot illustrations throughout here. I don't know. I'll never be able to find one now that I'm looking for it. Uh, well, I just passed one. Let's see if I can get right to it. Just little doodles. They took two seconds uh, for the artist to do, but 
uh, nevertheless, uh, always always good to have. Uh, okay, you're not Roman history either. Okay, this is this is Gil Hyatt, uh, and this is the exact same thing. I don't have a dust jacket for this. Well, I kind of wish I did. I never see this. I may never see another copy of this. This is uh, Gilbert Hyatt was also a writer on the classics, and he did a book of his occasional pieces. This is the same thing as uh, the Heart, the Eye of the Story. This is his book, A Clerk of Oxenford. Here, let's get the uh, the funnest piece. Oh wow, the Wolf and Fisk. Oh my, oh my. Uh, well, none of you are going to remember a bookstore called De Wolf and Fisk, that's for sure. Oh my, I'm dating myself. Uh, this is what, it's Essays on Art and Literature, with the title, of course, being uh, a glancing reference to Chaucer. And this is just a bunch, it's the same thing as Will Burnett, only on a much, much more elevated level of erudition and learning and eloquence of literary topics and literary people. I, uh... I don't think, if I remember correctly, this is one of those fancy pants books where the, the pieces are are not titled for helpfully understanding what they're about. Uh, no, no, they're not. Okay, so you get a title called an eminent historian, but you don't you don't get in the title of the piece who the eminent historian is. But that's all right because I have a few books by Gil Hyatt, and they are wonderful. His his magnum opus was something called the Classical Tradition, which I currently do not have. I have it as an ebook, but I don't have it. I don't have a print copy of it to stuff clipped reviews in. I will eventually find a hardcover of that book. I had it once upon a time. The trade paperback of the classical tradition, unfortunately, the only one that I know of, is so poorly made that I would turn it down. If I saw it for a dollar, I would turn it down because it's just going to blow apart like a bomb. Uh, but the hardcover, I know I will see it eventually. I know I will. Uh, okay, then we have a gigantic work. This is the Cambridge Ancient History. This is volume 10, which is Augustus. Augustus Caesar. So his seizure of power, his the arts that flourished under him, all of the, the stuff that he did militarily, all the people who were around him. A gigantic work. The Cambridge Ancient History is multi-volumes. By many different hands, every essay about in here, almost every essay in here about some aspect of Augustan rule will be by a different classicist. Wonderful stuff. Just wonderful. Uh, with, let me see if... Uh, with these, these gorgeous fold-out maps that are just incredibly detailed, and there are a few of them in every volume of the Cambridge Ancient History, I found this just naked, like this, just a naked hardcover, and that's fine by me because I know exactly what I want to do with it. I want to make a cover for it. And I did that with uh, the previous volume, the Cambridge Ancient History, Volume 9, uh, which is about the Roman Republic. It's about the exact same period we've seen Guglielmo and a couple of others here do. It's about the, the Roman Republic. It's flourishing and then it's fall. Uh, and with the Cambridge Ancient History Volume 9, I also found that as a naked hardcover, but I made a dust jacket for it. So it's Republican Rome. I wasn't going to call it the Cambridge Ancient History Volume 9. I said it's Republican Rome. And I, I originally had just a blank cover on it. Because I knew what I wanted. I wanted to put a New Yorker cartoon on the cover. And I knew exactly which one. I know the same thing for the Augustine thing. I just haven't done it yet. Uh, I put a New Yorker cartoon on the cover. You've got two clueless American tourists looking at the ruins of Rome. And the, the joke, the punchline at the bottom is, I suppose there's quite a story behind all this. <laughs> that is, and I thought, thought about that immediately when I saw this book. Because that is the, that's, this is that story. So, so I just need to, I need to do that with volume 10. I just haven't done it yet. Uh, Oh, okay, great. Uh, we're almost done here. Don't worry. It's it's all Rome, ancient Rome from here on out. This is from 1931. This is Arthur Weigel's book, his biography of Mark Antony. Uh, the best biography of Mark Antony that, that has uh, ever been written in English. And it's terrific. Mark Antony is also heavily documented from that same period, so you can easily write. And then one more to finish out here. This is... Uh, uh, Margaret Hubbard's book on Propertius, one of my favorite minor Rowan poets. I, I love him dearly. I love his stuff. And this was really good. A little bit dry, but really good. Uh, and there you have it. That is a bookcase mostly thinking about ancient Rome. <laughs> there were some other things here, because everything is a mess here. Uh, but uh, quite a bit, anyway, on ancient Rome. It's still mostly concentrated. There is there is a kernel of what I could do to save this if I would, if I would go about it. But I think what I'm going to do instead over the next two weeks is make it worse. Uh, so good that we're seeing it while we can. <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up for now. But I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.